Hi, my name is Van Batten. I'm a columnist for Guardian Australia, and thank you so much for coming to Utopia for Realists. My fabulous guest, Rutger Bregman. <laughs> Now, before we do anything at all, we have to make the most important acknowledgement of all. That is that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging for the honour of standing on this land tonight, a land that was stolen, never ceded. And I like to take just a couple of seconds for everybody who's Australian to remind themselves just of what that means. Thanks. Well, Rutger Bregman's excellent, and his book is great. You can tell because I've highlighted so many bits. <laughs> it's an absolutely fascinating pitch for a better, more enlightened, and most importantly, and why we're having this conversation in Australia tonight, a more equal and egalitarian time. Uh, Rutger has been described as one of the most exciting young thinkers in Europe, which, given the fact that Europe is pretty big, is really quite an <laughs> honour. Uh, he's been nominated for the European Press Prize, which is kind of a big deal twice. Uh, he has published four books. He's a historian. He writes about history, politics, and economics. He's got a lot of really fascinating things to say about the world, and he's said them in publications like The Guardian, which is, of course, the best publication in the world, and The Correspondent, which is some other thing that he's involved with. Can you please give him a huge <laughs> round of applause? Now, I've shanghaied Paul Rutger into reading a bit of his book, and then I'm going to interview him, and then we're going to go for questions. So if you're question-oriented, start thinking about that well in advance, and we'll have roving microphones go along. I am going to say this from the outset, though, with my full Tony Jones persona on, it will be about questions, not comments. And I will cut the sound to anybody who wants to read out memorised passages of anything. Is everybody cool with that? We're going to get along fine. Rutger, give us a read. Sure. All right, I thought I'd just read the first page of the book. Or actually, let's start with the, with the quote that's on the first page. It's a quote from Oscar Wilde that pretty much sums up my position on the importance of utopian thinking. A map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and, seeing a bet better country, sets sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. So that was by Oscar Wilde. Let's start with a little lesson in history. In the past, everything was worse. For roughly 99% of world's history, 99% of humanity was poor, hungry, dirty, afraid, stupid, sick, and ugly. As recently as the 17th century, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal described life as one giant veil of tears. Humanity is great, he wrote, because it knows itself, itself to be wretched. In Britain, fellow philosopher Thomas Hobbes concurred that human life was basically solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But in the last 200 years, all of that has changed. In just a fraction of the time that our species has clocked on this planet, billion, billions of us are suddenly rich, well-nourished, clean, safe, smart, healthy, and occasionally even beautiful. Where 84% of the world's population still lived in extreme poverty in 1820, by 1981 that percentage had dropped to 44%, and now, just a few decades later, it is under 10%. Now, if this trend holds, this, the, the extreme poverty that has been an abiding feature of life will soon be eradicated for good. Even those we still call poor will enjoy an abundance unprecedented in world history. In the country where I live, the Netherlands, a homeless person receiving public assistance today has more to spend than the average Dutch person in 1950, and four times more than people in Holland's glorious golden age when the country still ruled the seven seas. For centuries, time all but stood still. Obviously, there was plenty to fill the history books, but life wasn't exactly getting better. If you were to put an Italian peasant from 1300 in a time machine and drop him in 1870s Tuscany, he wouldn't notice much of a difference. 
Historians estimate that the average annual income in Italy around the year 1300 was uh, roughly $1,600. Now, some 600 years later, after Columbus, Galileo, Newton, the scientific revolution, the reformation, and the, Enlighten and the enlightenment, the invention of gunpowder, printing, the steam engine, it was still $1,600. So 600 years of civilization, and the average Italian was pretty much where he had always been. Now, it was not until about 1880, right around the time that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, Thomas Edison patented his light bulb, Carl Benz was tinkering with his first car, and Josephine Cochrane was ruminating what may just be the most brilliant idea ever, the dishwasher, that our Italian peasant got swept up in the march of progress. And what a wild ride it has been. The past two centuries have seen explosive growth in both, both population and prosperity worldwide. Per capita income is now 10 times what it was in 1850. The average Italian is 15 times as wealthy as in 1880. In the global economy, it is now 250 times what it was before the Industrial Revolution, when nearly everyone everywhere was still poor, hungry, dirty, afraid, stupid, sick, and ugly. So it starts with a bit of a bang. Um, and Rutger, I'm interested in what motivated you to write this book, and, wh and what was the moment that went, right, I'm going to make a pitch for a new mm -hmm. direction? How did that happen? What was that process? Well, I first wanted to acknowledge, you know, as, as a historian, that, you know, the past 200 years, have, we've seen tremendous progress, right? We are wealthier, we are healthier, uh, we are smarter than ever in many ways. Um, so, if you look at utopias throughout history, if you would go, for example, to the Middle Ages and ask a farmer who lived back then, you know, what is your utopia? Um, you know, this would pretty much be it, right? Um, a, a world where there's almost no hunger, where most people have a roof above their head, uh, can go to school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that pretty much every milestone of civilization, everything that we are adjusted to right now, whether it's you know, our incredible prosperity, or a democracy, or the rise of the welfare state, or equal rights for men and women, these were all utopian fantasies once. So progress always starts with a crazy idea. Now, the problem of today is, I believe, is not so much that we don't have the good, but that we have no vision of where we want to go next. So we have no new utopia. And as Oscar Wilde wrote long ago, that's not very good, because a map of the world without utopia is not worth even glancing at. And why do you think that is? Do you think we're still living in the, the sad realisation that the, you know, the socialist experiments in Eastern Europe cause so much misery? Like, what is behind our, our lack of utopian th thinking? Well, that's a big question. Um, you know, I was born in, in 1988, so that was one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, I don't mean to imply any causality, but um, I mean, my, my generation was obviously, uh, we grew up with the idea that the, the age of grant narratives had ended, right? Communism had fallen, and capitalism, liberal capitalism, was all that was left, right? Um, so when I went to university, for example, you know, we, we had to read all these philosophers, also, also leftist philosophers, postmodern philosophers who said, well, we don't do that anymore. We have no utopian big ideas anymore. That's just all from the past. And um, there were other intellectuals. Um, I mean, we had to read people like Karl Popper, for example, who said, well, that's really dangerous, all those utopian visions. Just look at communism, fascism, you know. It always ends really badly. Uh, but all that time, I had sort of the nagging sense that we had lost so something, uh, that, that, that there, there is a form of utopian thinking that we really cannot do without. Um, I think, to be honest, if you look at the state of current politics right now, I mean, you could argue that the right has sort of reinvented utopian thinking, but it doesn't long for the future, but it longs for the past. It's sort of a retrotopia. I mean, that's the Donald Trump, make America great again, like utopian thinking. And doesn't it uh, look great at the moment? I mean, neo-Nazis <laughs> in the streets, things burning. I mean, fantastic, right? That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty depressing. Um, and if you, if you look at the left, um, I mean, obviously, it's difficult to generalize, but let's do it anyway. Um, I think that the problem with, with the left these days is that it knows very well what it's against. It's against a lot of things. It's against uh, austerity, against the establishment, against 
the mainstream media, against homophobia, against racism. Um, there was even a book published uh, a few months ago by a famous New York intellectual, and the title of that book was Against Everything. And, and the first chapter of the, of the book is Against Exercise. Now, I'm against all those things, you know, especially exercise, but um, I think you also need to be for something, right? You also need to have some idea of where you want to go next. It's been interesting, particularly given the sort of Trump situation, to see the, the equal and opposite reaction in the rise of, say, uh, Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders getting close but not close enough. These candidates certainly seem to embody like a, a zeitgeist of, of moving forward, but the criticism that's been levelled at them is that the detail is sparse. Mm -hmm. Are they symptomatic of a, 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 of a progress mission, a progress project that's still trying to regain its language after so many words were destroyed by the Cold War? Well, there's someone who, for, I can't remember his name, but he wrote a quite good article for Jacobin, the, the American publication, who, who called Bernie Sanders and, and Corbyn, he called them the survivors. And that's basically what they are. I mean, back in the 70s, pretty much all politicians on the left were like them. I mean, they, they, all the standard package, like strong trade unions, you know, tackle inequality, uh, higher wages in the public sector, etc. And it's 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 a great package. Sure, I'm, I'm I, I would all be all in favor of that. The, the, I mean, most of their colleagues changed their mind, right, during the 90s, and they went off to become consultants and have great salaries. But somehow these, like Corbyn and, and Bernie Sanders, didn't. Um, it's it's almost like they have come out of a time machine and suddenly um, we were ready for. for for these kind of politicians. But it is true, though, that um, there are also some, I think, exciting new ideas out there that also deserve a, a political s stage. Uh, I really believe that universal basic income is one of them. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I think that real change doesn't really start in places like Washington or Westminster or within the Labour Party or... Um, I think it often starts in, well, in places like this or just people coming together at the local level who have these kind of crazy ideas and, you know, spread them to their friends. I think that's, that's often how it starts. At least that's how it started, for example, with basic income in Holland. You know, it really, the whole, there are now 20 cities that want to start a basic income experiment and that it really started on the local level. It was only a few years later that uh, national politicians, for example, from the Green Party started calling me and said, for example, said, um, do you think we already should be talking about basic income yet. Do you think it will get me votes already? So I think that sort of illustrates how it works, you know? It, it, never, it never starts in the political capitals of the world. It always ends there. It is interesting because certainly with Corbyn and Sanders, it's extraordinary to think, you know, these beacons of a, like a, a new progressive enlightenment mm -hmm. are actually like old white men, like all, yeah. you know, they're demographically indivisible from all the other old white men that caused all the problems. <laughs> Um, and, I mean, I'm interested to know, with your book and with, the, obviously, a community of ideas that's around you, is there a leadership coming from a younger generation? What does that leadership look like? Uh, are we looking at, a, you know, with your book and the movement you represent, are we on the precipice of a new youth-led rebellion mm -hmm. like we saw in the 1960s, or do you think we've still got some way to go? I'm not sure yet. The feeling I have got right now is that there is a tremendous amount of political energy just lying around and someone can just take it and use it for whatever purpose and it can go either direction. Uh, that's, that's sort of the sense, sense I get when it, especially, uh, you know, the, the countries that I know a little bit more about, like, like Holland or, or, or the UK. Um, what I discovered, for example, when I started writing about basic income in, in 2013, it was a completely forgotten idea, like nobody really know, knew what it was. Uh, in Dutch, the word basic income is basis income, uh, and that's sort of the same as base salary. Uh, uh, and we used it only, only in one context, like the base salary of the bankers. So, so most people thought when I started talking about basic income, like, oh, do you want higher base salaries for bankers? <laughs> what are you even talking about? Um, uh, it was really interesting to see how quickly such an idea can spread, uh, especially among uh, young people and that they were not really interested in sort of all the abstract philosophical discussions like what is human nature like, are we fundamentally creative or lazy or whatever. They were really interested in can we actually do this, you know, can we start an experiment somewhere, um, how would that work, 
who do we have to get on board to do that? Maybe that's a little bit of a difference. It, it is interesting to think of like the, the fascination being with the experiment, mm -hmm. not necessarily the policy. And I mean, it's sort of wonderful reading your book because I'm a little, a little bit, not very much, but a little bit older than you. And um, certainly when I was at University, Francis Fukuyama, who we had another name for at mm -hmm. university because I was in the left, um, he, had, he had declared that history was over, that it was all finished, that capitalism had won, neoliberalism was perfect. Mm -hmm. And now in this country, we have record inequality. Like, we have not been this unequal for 70 years. We have stagnating wages, uh, even though we've got impressively mm -hmm. increased productivity. And our regional centres are crippled with really serious social problems around unemployment. I mean, before the last federal election, I don't know if everybody knows this, youth unemployment in Townsville was up to 20%. And in Indigenous communities in Townsville, it was 30%. Like, mm -hmm. these are massive structural problems underneath the economy. Do you think that, you know, the experiment is more important than the actual policy? Do you think we're exploring a new dreamland because we're... We have been out of ideas for so long? Well, there are many roads to utopia, I'd say. Um, the, the experiment is, is, is politically, I think, a smart strategy, because if you are against experiments, then, well, there's, there, I mean, everyone's for getting more knowledge, right? Yeah, to not learn necessarily more about... <laughs> in this country, actually, but can I... But it's, it's a hard position to defend anyway. Um, so uh, I, think, I think in that... But, I mean, you could also, with... A, with we could also make our current welfare state look, let it look a little bit more like the OBI. So I'm not saying that, I don't know, experiments is the only way forward or anything. And I'm also not saying that other um, initiatives to strengthen the welfare state are not important. So there are some people, especially in Silicon Valley or on the libertarian right, who say, well, let's just get rid of the whole welfare state of universal health care, et cetera, et cetera, and let's replace it with one small cash grant. And let me be clear about that. That, be, that would be a real disaster. I really see the basic income as a supplement to all the other great achievements of social de democracy. You know, it would be the crowning achievement, uh, but it's really something that you put on top of all the other, other things. So how, where did it come to you, basic income? Like you said that the first time you heard the term, mm -hmm. you thought it had something to do with like banker contracts. Yeah. So where did it come from? Well, this what is a funny story, answer? actually. Um, I had already written about the need for a radically shorter working week. So I had already written uh, an essay about, you know, Keynes' prediction that we would all be working 15 hours a week in 2030 and that something went wrong since the 1980s, that we've been working more and more and consuming more stuff that we don't really need. So I was interested in a simple question. How do we get people to work less? You know, what do we have to do then? So I was just sitting in my chair and thinking, hmm, well, maybe, maybe if you just give them money, you know, at some point, maybe people just stop working. And I, so, so I started Googling it, free money, work, experiments, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know, I came onto some, onto some obscure blog uh, that talked about basic income. I'd never heard about it before. So I started researching that, and uh, yeah, that's sort of how I got into all these fascinating experiments that happened in the 1970s in the US and Canada. And I quickly discovered that a basic income is a very bad way to get people to do, to do less. Well, maybe they, they do less paid work and more unpaid work, but often people you know, get up and do do more, actually, um, are more creative. There's, there's one funny example in, uh, of, a, uh, of a sort of basic income-like policy we had in Holland, uh, where for about two or three decades, uh, artists uh, uh, could receive a basic income from the government, and there, it was pretty much unconditional. The only thing they had to do is produce a piece of art, like every month, month or so. And if they couldn't sell it, then, the government, then they could give it to the government. Uh, now, the problem was, is that well, some people might expect, well, with a basic income, people will probably be lazy and watch Netflix, etc. Well, the problem was the, the exact opposite here. Today, up until this, this day, like many, many cities and, and, and municipalities are debating in the Netherlands, what do we do with like the mountains of art that we, <laughs> that we created in this period? Like all the archives are full with, with way too many paintings and sculptures, etc. So there, it was like an explosion of creativity as these people were, yeah, a bit too creative almost. <laughs> One of the things I found really interesting about the book uh, was the story of how close Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. not, a, not a person who Australians would necessarily associate with some kind of great progressive social experiment, mm -hmm. 
um, was one was a proponent of a basic income and had declared war on poverty. And I'd love you to recount the story of what happened there because it is a truly fascinating piece of history. Yeah, and I think it's a great example as well of that real change doesn't start again with with politicians or in the centre, etc. I mean, Nixon here was just the end of the line. Um, not many people know that at the end of the 60s, almost everyone in the US believed that some form of basic income, of a guaranteed annual income, was going to be implemented sooner uh, or later. So um, Martin Luther King had come out in favor of it. Uh, the famous left-wing economist John Kenneth Galbraith was in favor of it. And Milton Friedman, even the neoliberal economist, they all thought this is it. You know, there had been a letter on the front page of the New York Times signed by a thousand economists who all said we need this policy. Um, and Nixon basically thought at the beginning of the 70s, he thought, all right, I mean, if everyone wants this, uh, there, there's, he, he sat behind his closed doors, he had this comment that he said, um, history is made by conservative presidents with progressive ideas or progressive proposals. So that was sort of his idea. Uh, and he had a m proposal for a, for a uh, modest basic income um, and send it to the House of Representatives, and it got through there. It was only killed in the Senate twice, actually, by the Democrats because they wanted a higher basic income. It's, it's, it's really ironical. I mean, they believed that, that they could vote against it because they thought, oh, another bill will, will, will surely come. I mean, basic income is inevitable anyway. You know, it was only at the end of the 70s that people forgot about the idea. There was some unfortunate result from a Seattle experiment where they found out that the, a basic income uh, increases the, the, the divorce rate by 50%. So at that point, all the conservatives said, no, 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 we can't have basic income. Uh, this, this turned out to be a mistake, by the way. Uh, 10 years later, they found out that it was a statistical mistake. So in reality, the divorce rate did not go up. Um, but I think that if you, if you really look at their history, it's so full of bizarre coincidences. And it, I think it really shows you that in the end, um, there's nothing inevitable in these kind of developments. It could easily have happened. And also when people say, oh, we need basic income because of the robots, hmm, no, we needed it 40 years ago, right? We don't need to wait for the robots. We are already more than rich enough. We've got the means, we've got the research. Uh, we've got so much evidence that it really works. Uh, why wait? Uh, well, I can play devil's advocate as to mm -hmm. why to wait. I mean, uh, you're arriving in Australia at a very interesting time. Like I said, wages are stagnating. Um, we've had an ongoing attacks on our welfare state, the uh, erosions of the services that we once took for granted. And we have a government that uh, are recently elected, only just over a year ago, on a platform of giving... $65 billion worth of tax concessions to corporations who made uh, a 40% profit on their work from last year. When we're living in a, in a cultural moment where the orthodoxy is still you know, attached to uh, trickle-down economics, something that we know has been debunked, mm -hmm. that you, we have all the economic evidence of the world, like the you know, garbage fire, which is America, to look at rising inequality and the, the problems with that system. Mm -hmm. Why is there such a resistance to, a, to a, a more collectivist approach mm -hmm. to the dispersal of wealth? I mean, apart from the obvious. Why are people voting in governments that do these kind of things? It's, I mean, it's a really big question. I probably... I, I mean, love you could, big questions. Could, could write, I write for The Guardian. Yeah, what we're yeah. all about. <laughs> could write a lot of books about it. But I guess that one of the problems that, that is, that's happening here all the time is that um, in, in politics, there is an eternal battle for concepts like freedom or progress or innovation or e efficiency, right? These are things that everyone is for. Everyone is for freedom. Everyone is for making things more efficient. Everyone wants progress. Now... In the 1960s, and actually for a long time, um, you, you could argue for 100 or 150 years, all these words were mainly used by the left. Like the left was the party of progress and, and of making things more efficient and have innovation and, and giving people freedom. Innovation uh, is a big word here. As long as it's agile, we love a bit of agile. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All these words are basically were, were hijacked by conservatives or, and, and by the right. Now, what I try to do in the book, the, the trick that I try to pull is sort of to use that language that, that we now perceive as right-wing language. I try to use it and to defend progressive ideals. So, for example, if you argue about, talk about something like eradicating poverty, you could say, well, we, we should eradicate poverty because 
we should pity all these poor people. It's just a scandal, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a certain part, I think a relatively small part of the population that will be receptive to that kind of language and argument, uh, the, sort of the caring uh, language. You could also say, well, eradicating poverty is just a very smart and rational proposal, uh, proposal policy. Um, it's an investment that pays for itself. We've got a mountain of evidence uh, that shows that if you eradicate poverty, healthcare costs go down, crime goes down, kids perform much better in school, uh, you know, people become uh, taxpayers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this just makes sense. Uh, and, and there are some, some stories in the book actually also about right-wing politicians who realize this. For example, um, uh, conservative policy in Utah, like a, the, uh, he was a Mormon, very conservative state, and he looks at the numbers of, of what we should do about homelessness and realizes that it's actually cheaper to give people free apartments than to let them live on the streets. And this is something that we find time and time again. Um, there are, there are, it, it makes sense. So even if, you, even if you don't have a heart, you still have a wallet, right? <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the strategies we could use to, to make our sort of these old-fashioned leftist proposals much more interesting. So explain, because I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here, who, who's, who's referent with universal basic income as a concept? Who's not? Who's like, what, what is this thing? Rook, maybe it's useful for you to explain how the concept works. So sure. Everybody... sure. Well, it's a, it's a very, very simple idea. A ba basic income is a monthly grant that is enough to pay for your basic needs. So that's food, shelter, clothing. Now, it differs from country to country how high it will be, but most people would say that it has to be uh, on the poverty line or above that. So it has to be enough to get you out of poverty. Um, that, is, that is basically it. And there are many, many forms of how you could implement this policy, how you could finance it, uh, you could make it universal so that everyone will get it, whether you're rich or poor, employed or unemployed. You could also say, let's make it a guaranteed annual income so that you just top up the income of everyone who who goes uh, beneath the poverty line, so there are many versions. Uh, but what I'm arguing for in the book is really like the guaranteed annual income, completely eradicate poverty and give everyone the means to decide for themselves you know, what to do with their lives. Um, I've got to say, uh, any idea that's backed by Milton Friedman is one that I personally mm -hmm. am quite suspicious of. Mm -hmm. So why are like radical neoliberals like Friedman in support of a universal basic income? Well, there's something that libertarians like about it. I mean, if you would introduce a basic income, you could strengthen the role of the state in, in some way. I mean, what, when we, the welfare state we have now is in many ways quite paternalistic, right? It, uh, it often, like the old left often says, sure, we want to help you, but on our terms. So you've got to do this, an employment a course for the unemployed or whatever, or we're going to send you this care worker that's going to look at your bills and help you with that, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that libertarians or people of the, on the right often don't like. What I think that a basic income does is combine the best of left-wing and right-wing thinking. So yes, the left will get its eradication of poverty, reduce inequality, but the right will get a smaller state in, in terms of paternalism. And in that sense, yes, I mean, it's true that many of the ideas in my book sort of try to move beyond the old-fashioned distinction between the political left and the political right. And I think that's also what attracts maybe especially people from my generation, is that they're just a little bit fed up with all the old boring discussions between left and right, and et cetera. But I mean, as I said, um, don't fall into the trap of thinking that we could just abolish the welfare state and introduce one basic income, and that, that will be an improvement. So in that sense, you're absolutely right to be a little bit skeptical of, of libertarians uh, or, well, people like uh, Milton Friedman um, that are enthusiastic about this idea. And certainly in the context where, you know, the, the ongoing project of the neoliberal right is the erosion of the state, and, mm -hmm. and, and not merely to erode the state, but to erode the very principle of collectivism. It does seem a bit of a contradiction that to, to fund a system that empowers everybody economically with disposable income would require the most radical transformation of taxation collection in history, and I can't necessarily see our libertarian friends getting behind that. Is that a, a challenge? Well, I for think the actually the basic income is a Trojan horse for, the, for our libertarian friends. So one of the most radical effects of a basic income will be 
that it's a universal strike fund, right? If you have a basic income, you can always go on strike. So what will happen with teachers, nurses, um, care workers, garbage collectors, all the people who do the really, really important work, you know? They're not sending emails to other people all day, they're doing actual stuff. Um, you know, what will happen? They'll have a lot more bargaining power, so the wages will have to go up. With a basic income, it's the most important and most overlooked effect of a basic income, wages will much better reflect the social value of the jobs that we do. I mean, we've got so many jobs right now. Actually, it seems sort of the rule almost in modern capitalism is that the more you earn, the less valuable your work is. I mean, maybe there are some exceptions. You could argue that doctors are an ex exception, but in general, the, the rule is, works pretty well. I mean, look at corporate lawyers, consultants, bankers. I mean, bankers is a great example. But there's recent studies from the International Monetary Fund or the Bank of International Settlements that shows, I mean, not leftist, leftist think tanks, right? Neoliberal institutions, you'd say. Now, even these guys say that as soon as the financial sector gets bigger than 100% of GDP, um, it starts destroying wealth. Now, in many countries, um, countries like Holland, Australia, the UK, it has, has become, got bigger than 150% of GDP or 200% of GDP. So about half of all bankers should basically earn a negative salary, you know, if you are really in favor of meritocracy. That's another one of those words, meritocracy. Everyone's in favor of that. Well, if we would have a real meritocracy in this country or in all the other developed countries, well, <laughs> that'd be quite radical, right? Then, then, then so many white-collar workers with excellent resumes would start earning a negative salary because they should destroy more wealth than they create. I've got to say, um, one of the things I really love about this book is how friendly it is. Like, for a book about history and politics and economics, um, it is written in such an engaging way. And um, it was a delight to encounter a chapter entitled Bullshit Jobs, <laughs> um, where Rooker goes into some detail about just how bullshit some jobs really can be. Um, on the subject of meritocracy, though, and I say this about my own reservations about universal basic income, mm -hmm. when I look at a proposal that says everybody gets enough money to live, mm -hmm. um, I look at it, obviously, as a feminist and as an advocate for inclusion and diversity. Because in, in, certainly in this country, like the structure of work is very gendered. Um, the structure of work is very exclusive. Um, everything from the, the temperature of the air conditioning in buildings, and there was a big article about this a couple of years ago, and in our parliament house is geared towards men wearing suits and ties, which you can mm. imagine in Australia is kind of completely ridiculous, but we do it anyway. Um, issues to do with uh, women in pregnancy, women's health, uh, the patriarchal tradition of childcare being a woman's responsibility. I look at universal basic income as a Trojan horse for the side of feminists and mm -hmm. also particularly disability advocates whose ongoing campaign is for workplaces that enfranchise us, that are flexible, that give us access, that are accommodating. Um, the fact that there are jobs in this country you cannot do if you're in a wheelchair is you know, disgusting and disgraceful. Mm -hmm. In the case of a universal basic income where a, you know, a community can turn around and go, well, everybody's got money. We don't need to reform our workplaces. We don't need to put in ramps. We don't need to enfranchise you with flexible hours because you have an income. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a real structural risk there about maintaining and even entrenching the systems mm -hmm. that already exclude people from the liberation, which is socialization mm -hmm. through work? I think there's a real risk. I mean, every great idea can be hijacked, right? That has happened so many times in history. If you look at things like participatory democracy, which I'm a really big fan of, or even stuff like mindfulness, you know, everything can be hijacked by the neoliberals. But I think that's not a reason to just turn back. I just think it's a reason to be very specific about what future you actually want and what form of basic income you really want and what other policies, policy you, you, you would like to see alongside of it. Um, and to be honest, I think that a basic income would advance the, the, the cause of feminists in, in two important ways. Um, in the first place, a basic income is a recognition of the fact that so much of the really important work we do is unpaid. And historically, and still up until this day, much of, most of that unpaid work um, has been done and is done by women, like caring for our children, caring for our elderly, lots of volunteers' work. 
participating in our lo local communities, you name it. And a basic income is a recognition of that, that fact, that that is really, really important work and that we need to provide people with the means to do more of that. Um, now, the other thing, it connects to what I was saying earlier, is that most of the jobs with relatively low wages uh, but very high social value are also dominated by women. So it's mostly women who will get that extra bargaining power that I was just talking about. So I'm not saying it's sort of a panacea, but to be honest, I think a basic income is something a feminist today should be, should be for. Um, you can imagine, as a woman whose experience of feminism has <laughs> been quite direct, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've got to say, and especially in this country as well, where workplaces have served the colonial project mm -hmm. to marginalise and exclude Indigenous people. And reading the book, like, I, I certainly... I can see all your arguments, but writing from the lens of somebody who lives in, you know, a colonising community mm -hmm. as opposed to a colonised one... Again and again in this country, we have to look at the economic reality, which is the disposition of Aboriginal people, land stolen, um, deprived of access to social institutions. And I, I, I can't help but keep seeing the notion of a universal basic income as a way to keep those walls up mm -hmm. and to, as a means of um, perpetuating a de-skilling and a, a prevention of access to mm -hmm. forms of social power. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as a European, how do, you, how do you countenance that? Well, the devil's in the details. So how do you finance it, for example? I mean, you could finance a basic income with, I don't know, something, a consumption tax. And we know that consumption taxes are highly regressive, so they mainly are paid by the middle, lower middle classes and the middle classes and, and the poor, and the rich relatively pay little consumption taxes. So if you do it that way, yeah, it'd probably be disastrous, and probably inequality will go up. Now, that's not what I'm advocating at all, obviously. I'd say that the rich will basically have to pay for the, the basic income, at least in the, in the short run. Um, they'll pay for five basic income and receive only one, right? Don't get me wrong. I think that in the long run, they'll benefit as well because everyone benefits from living in a society where no one has to sleep on the streets, mm. where no one is in poverty, you know? There's, there's some fascinating research, uh, that I go, new research that I go over in the book that, that shows that if you get people out of the poverty, that their IQ goes up by 13 or 14 points. So just imagine what an explosion of energy and creativity it would mean if we would give millions of people more opportunities. Just imagine what an explosion of creativity it would mean if all those people in, in meaningless jobs would stop doing that and would do something that would actually create something of value, right? Um, Anyone, everyone will benefit that, uh, because of that, even and also the rich. Um, but in the short term, uh, yes, it's an, it's an investment, and I think that investment should mainly be paid for by the rich, especially uh, now that inequality is rising and rising. Dude, if you're raising a people's army to seize control of the state, I've got no problem with that. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I, I found some of the... It was actually really quite moving, your consideration in the book about the impact of inequality, particularly on children. Mm -hmm. and, and you were talking about how, like, removing poverty, and you used the case of a Cherokee community yeah. who had to build a casino to have a reliable, renewable source of income that they could mm -hmm. control on their own land. Um, that, that suddenly you saw improved health outcomes, you see improved educational yeah. outcomes. Um, I'd, if you could talk to the audience about some of the things you mentioned in the book, because there were some st statistics and realities about the effects of those inequalities, which yeah. were just really upsetting. Well, well what, I've, what I've discovered while talking about this book is that people are really most convinced by stories of, of, of like cities or governments that actually experimented with this and what actually really happens. So one of the stories in the book is about an experiment that happened in Canada in 1974. Uh, it was a small town called Dauphin, where they gave, guaranteed everyone a basic income. So it was, the, it was called the town with no poverty. The experiment ran for four years, and during those four years, you know, there were a lot of economists, sociologists, anthropologists, who all descended on the town and did their research. So they did interviews, they collected data, they looked at all the, the numbers and the graphs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in 1978, uh, there was a new government that came to power in Canada, and they looked at this experiment and thought, what are you doing? I mean, you are giving free money to people unconditionally. So they said, well, stop this at once, and there was no money left to analyze the results. Um, the researchers had to put all their files away in 2,000 boxes. 
And then 25 years uh, went by uh, until a Canadian professor, Evelyn Forget, uh, heard about the records, found them, did the analysis, and indeed discovered that it had been a huge success. Uh, crime went down, kids performed much better in school. Um, uh, the hospitalization rate decreased by 8.5%, which is huge if you look at the amount of money we spend in, in, in developed society, on societies on, on hospitals. So 8.5%, that's like billions, billions of dollars. Uh, and indeed, this is, this is what you find uh, when we look at these kind of experiments in the, the experiment you talked about with the, um, with the casino that opened in the, in the 1990s. It's pretty much the same result, but with one even more interesting twist is that another researcher from uh, UCLA uh, later calculated that actually the benefits of the basic income in terms of lower healthcare costs, lower crime rates, you know, et cetera, all those things you don't have to spend money on anymore, were actually higher than the basic income grants themselves. So it really is an investment that pays for itself. Now, I, I think it's, it's, it's really a pity that I almost never hear any leftist politician to make the case for, for doing something about poverty in that way. It's almost always the case, like, we should do this because we are morally obliged and because we should... You know, and then the right only has to say, yeah, sure, but we can't afford it. No, what we really cannot afford is poverty. We cannot afford to, let, to, let, to waste so much talent, to waste so much energy, so many people who could really give a great contribution to the common good. But can we make that argument as well that, you know, rather than an, an individualization of income, and certainly, like, I'm a cheerleader for the welfare state and believe passionately... In the, in the investment of pensions and of the dollar. I've been on the dollar myself. Um, but the, the, there's an argument around other forms of economic investment that provide people with structures for socialisation. Mm -hmm. For example, um, in, in this country, we're building a conversation around cooperatives and investments in new for, uh, businesses that are controlled by workers themselves mm -hmm. and how important this is in regional areas, you know, for where margins can be tighter because mm -hmm. you're not a pro like a profit-making business, you're a self-sustaining business. And that there are arguments around, you know, the state capitalising collaborative projects mm -hmm. that, you know, have meaning and, and points of access around what people can do and what they want to do, in the mm -hmm. great words of Abby Hoffman, but not looking at fulfilment just as an individual exercise. Well, to be honest, I, I think that the state or government officials or bu bureaucrats don't really know what people really need and really want. Uh, actually, I think that many people will use the basic income to start these kind of cooperatives, but, because now suddenly they have the time. But who are we to know what, what, they, what they really can contribute? I mean, if we go over the evidence of so many of, of our government programs that are, that are supposed to help the unemployed or the poor, for example, courses that, uh, I don't know, LinkedIn training and that kind of stuff that, that we let the unemployed do, often they're forced to do it, by the way, incredibly ineffective. Sometimes the unemployment length even goes up. Um, if we look at stuff like money management training, it's a complete disaster. I mean, there are huge studies in peer-reviewed journals right now that sometimes show that people who get money management training courses actually make worse decisions with their money um, because, you know, they're, they're really busy and have, they have to attend this stupid mm -hmm. class as well. Um, so what I really believe is that the real experts on people's lives are the people themselves. Um, there's, there's a great NGO called Give Directly, um, started a few years ago, and what they do is, well, the money, the name says it, uh, they just give money directly to very, very poor people in Uganda and Kenya. Now, I'm su subscribed to their newsletter, and a few months ago, they, 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 they sent an overview of a few, uh, uh, or a lot of short interviews they did with all the people who received this grant, and it was really, it was really moving to see how diverse the ideas were that people came up with. One example was of a man who had used the money to buy a chainsaw. Now, I thought that was really, really funny. Because, I mean, have you ever heard of an NGO that hands out chainsaws to people, right? But, I mean, he started a, a small company around it, and he earns now five times as much as he did before. So it was obviously the best idea for him and for his family and for his, you know, all his friends. Uh, but there's, there's no one who could, could have come up with them uh, come up with that, apart from that man himself. 
Okay, I'm going to open it up to questions because I'm aware that I'm dominating Rutger because I find him really interesting and I loved his <laughs> book. Um, questions? Uh, and can you wave the microphone? People will run to you. There's somebody down here, this woman down here. Yes, woman, woman pointing to man. Woman pointing to man down here. Thank you. Um, incoming still back to the whole question of uh, political realism mm -hmm. in all of the stuff that you're talking about. And uh, I know here in Australia, the adversiality of politics, them and us, you know, uh, the retardant form of democracy that we really have. The question is, do you agree that in countries like Holland, where I'm also from originally, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden, there is a much, much better chance of bringing to fruition and reality some of the stuff that you're talking about purely mm -hmm. because of the fact that, you know, there is a, a politics of participation, there is a more democratic way, and you can see in Holland, we had elections on the 15th of March, and we now, only now, are forming a cabinet, but still, there are really opportunities there for carrying out some of this stuff uh, as already has occurred in the last mm -hmm. 45 years? Well, the story of Holland that I can, that I can tell you is sort of, it, it proves your point, but in a much more pessimistic way, probably. Um, so what we've seen about 15 years ago was the rise of Geert Wilders, very extreme right-wing politician who absolutely hates Muslims and, and Islam and just goes, Every, every week or every day, he, he radicalizes further. Now, you, you might say, well, he, that, those kind of polit politicians are not very influential because they never get into power. I mean, he's never been a minister, he never got into a cabinet or anything, but he's been incredibly influ influential because he's been dragging all the other parties to the right. So this is the example of how the right sort of uh, has reinvented the art of utopian thinking. I mean, he is unreasonable. He is unrealistic. You could see him as, as completely ludicrous and crazy. And that's how, it's been, how he's been really, really influential. So that's, that's basically what has been happening in Holland and actually, I think, in, in many other countries in Europe as well. Um, there's, a, there's a positive counterexample of that, probably, of what happened in the Labour Party. I mean, for, for years and years, people in the UK, many pundits, politicians said, Labour cannot be too far to the left because then it will lose votes. You know, it's got to stay a little bit in the center because otherwise it will, it will be unelectable, etc. cetera. Um, then Jeremy Corbyn came along and many people predicted that it would be a disaster and then suddenly he had the biggest win of seats since 1946. So all this time, it turned out that the Labour Party was not too radical. It was not radical enough. Um, so regardless of what kind of specific political system you have, you know, whether you have a completely proportional system like in Holland or whether you have a winner-take-all system like in, in the UK, I think that in the end, history is really governed by ideas and, and, and new ideas. And those often uh, come from the fringes and not from the center. Yeah, it's always interesting to hear people say, oh, you know, we wish, we wish it was less combative. We'd like them to get along more. When the history of this country is the moment the Labour Party went, yeah, we're, we'll talk to them. Mm -hmm. Everybody started hating them, never forgave them for it. All right. <laughs> uh, can I have a woman ask a question? Are you a woman down here? Hello. <laughs> if, you're, if you're up the back, by the way, and you want to ask a question, be, be visible, because I'm quite blind. Oh, how lovely. Thank you. Um, the woman down here. Yes? Did you put your hand up? Yes? Run, 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 microphone. You mentioned some experiments that have taken place. Can you tell a bit about sure. how long they've been going and what's happened with them? Sure. So as I said, four or five years ago, basic income was completely forgotten. What we now have seen is that on the 1st of January, uh, Finland has started a basic income experiment with 2,000 participants. Even more exciting, I think, is the experiment that Canada has announced, with 4,000 people who will participate in that. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot of interest in Silicon Valley in basic income because they think they're gonna that their robots are going to take all the jobs. Uh, so there's an experiment in Oakland that is about to start. A huge experiment is being done and funded by, by Give Directly, the organization I talked about, with more than 10,000 participants in Kenya. So it's really the golden age of, of, of new basic income experiments, and, and, and I, think, I think that is really one of the ways 
uh, one of the roads towards a, a better welfare system. Because we can learn a lot along the way, but they're also a great way to, to get people interested in these ideas, you know, to attract attention. Sorry, I can't. Uh, the, the, the one in Finland has just started, yeah, and the other ones haven't started yet. Well, in, in Kenya has also just started. Okay, next. In the middle, up at the back. And we'll use these microphone delivery moments so we can think, can you keep your hand reflect. Up? That's not a criticism, you're doing great. Um, Rutger, to what extent do you think uh, our common conceptions of what work is and what work means will be a barrier to implementing mm -hmm. universal basic income universally? Because experiments are great, but yeah. if it's not going to become universal, um, so to what extent are we going to be our worst enemies in the way we see work? That's a really, really good question. Um, you know, throughout the 20th century, there were many great philosophers and thinkers who all believed that we would be working less and less and less, right? There were John Maynard Keynes, I already mentioned him, but there were also people like Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction writer who predicted that boredom will be the great challenge of the future. Now, since the 1980s, as we all know, uh, the opposite has started to happen. So we've been working more and more ever since. Well, two explanations. The one is consumerism, you know, we keep on buying stuff we don't need. Uh, and the other, the other, I think more credible explanation is the rise of meaningless jobs or bullshit jobs. As bullshit the, jobs. As the, as the, uh, it's, it's not my term actually, it's from David Graeber, uh, one of my favorite thinkers, uh, an American anthropologist. Um, so what I think, when we, for example, when we talk about the rise of robots that are going to take all our jobs, what we underestimate is that capitalism is really good at coming up with new jobs that don't really need to exist. So, according to some recent polls, um, there's a recent poll, for example, from Belgium that says that about 30% of all Belgium, uh, Belgium um, uh, workers think their job is absolutely useless. When I read that, I thought, oh, well, Belgium, I mean, <laughs> uh, but... Is that, it even a country? <laughs> but then I found out... They have I, such long memories, <laughs> Europeans, don't they? <laughs> Actually, actually, then I found out that in the UK, it's 37% of all British workers who, have a completely, who, who think their own job is completely meaningless. And then I found out that actually in my own country, Holland, it's 40%. So <laughs> um, it's around the developed world, it seems as pretty much like a third of, or at least a third of all workers think their job is useless. And I think that sort of shows that we completely need to rethink what work even is. I mean, so often these days, we define work as you know, just earning money and, 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 and paying taxes and being in a hierarchical relationship with an employer, and that is work. Well, I think we should define as wor work as doing something useful, you know, creating something of value. And you can f define that for yourself. Uh, but if people say about their own job that it's completely useless, then it probably is, right? And, and I really had some, some politicians, for example, say to me, like, yeah, but these people don't really know that they're actually valuable. Like, that is paternalistic, right? Um, I think that people are the experts on their own jobs. So you're absolutely right. There, need, there needs to be a big rethink of what work even is. Um, everybody who has a job in the room, put your hand up. If you're working, put your hand up. Now, keep your hand up if your job is bullshit. And if your job is not bullshit, take it down. So there, there is, you know, maybe Australia's... Um, of course, here... But that's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. That there are actually people, you know... Um, it's the world's most livable city, Rutka. We're all yeah. very invested here. No, but because, I mean, that, that there are actually people, like, w willing in public to say, yes, I have a bullshit job. Because, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is one of the big taboos of our times. I really believe that. Um, have you ever had a bullshit job? Oh, that's a great question. No, I don't think so. I think I, everything I did, I, I had a lot of like, like small jobs when I was a student. I was uh, uh, carrying dead people towards their graves. I think that was useful. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, actually the most interesting phenomenon that I've encountered in the past um, few years is the phenomenon of the part-time bullshit job. So this is, this is where it gets really interesting. In journalism, for example, you must know about this. 
So a lot of journalism want to do, journalists want to do investigative journalism, right? That is really interesting and really important. But as we all know, it doesn't really pay you any money, right? So what yeah, do you spoiler do? Spoiler alert, doesn't pay <laughs> you any money. Okay. So what do you do? Uh, first, as a journalist, you write ads or advertorials or whatever. You write ads for companies that you really, really hate. And you earn a lot of money with that. And then you use that money to do investigative journalism into exactly those kind of companies. So that is sort of, you could call it the circle of bullshit. In, in, in modern capitalism, we fund the things that we really care about with bullshit. I mean, I see that happening all the time. Like, for example, lawyers and consultants who say, yes, yes, I, I mean, I really should do something else with their lives. And then what do they do? You know, they use all the money they have earned and, and st start doing some pro bono work or whatever that, that they think is really important. So this is sort of the, this thing that keeps happening. And the only thing that I'm proposing is that just cut the crap, you know? <laughs> Immediately start doing what you really think is important. But there's that argument too, I mean, for building up social institutions because they become a form of structural learning. And it, it, on this point specifically, there's a great bit in your book where you talk about how in America, since the Reagan era and trickle-down economics, you've seen this transfer of talented young people yeah. from diverse backgrounds yeah. who pursue jobs in the financial sector because that's where the money is and that's where the security is. I have a friend, a brilliant guy from a you know, lower middle-class family in New Jersey who um, wanted to be a theatre producer and did you know, degrees in uh, creative practice. But because he's in America, he found out he had a heart defect mm -hmm and found out just in time to change the focus of his life to becoming a tax attorney, because without the provision of a universal yeah. healthcare system, there were all of these doors would be shut to him and he would essentially be condemned to either an early death or a life in poverty, yeah. if, unless he made that decision. I mean, this is a massive reform yeah. project for us to take on. Um, well, it's a great point. I mean, even when we think about emancipation of, of women or racial minorities, it often means that that people get into jobs like they're they're also allowed to exploit the that is often what our or the de, the definition of, of feminist like I don't know, Sheryl Sandberg lean in kind of feminism that is you know the emancipation is complete when we are also allowed to have these bullshit jobs and exploit the the the, the underclass well I'd rather have a different kind of feminism and yeah. I think you do too yeah right? there's a there's a brilliant book uh, you guys like reading um, there's a brilliant book by Hilton Ulls called White Girls he's a um, African American queer writer and there's an essay where he talks about how within the capitalist system the women in those leadership roles aren't feminists because feminists are humanists and that's incompatible with the mm. profit project and we'll take another question and then we're almost done the last one can I have a woman in the pink Wait a minute, the microphone is coming to you. Thank you. I think um, this is really interesting, so thank you for that. I'm wondering, I'm going to try to be a little bit provocative. Mm -hmm. So I'm finding that the idea of um, a universal basic income, I think is really great, particularly for the reasons, I think, it might be very valuable for how we, like, rethinking work, valuing, caring, um, liberating people, encouraging creativity. But every time that the discussion gets to those things, I'm finding that um, people start talking about all the other rules that should accompany the universal basic income because it won't in itself, paying people off to do the child rowing obviously won't emancipate women, right? Mm -hmm. Or, and the same is so with ethnic minorities, of other, pe other people who are in various ways excluded from the labor market. So what I want to ask you is whether the unibase, universal basic income is a radical enough idea for the problems that we're facing today. Mm -hmm. And you've got to answer that in one minute. Okay. <laughs> well, I believe that basic income and some of the other ideas in my book, like rethinking work or even more radical idea that we haven't even talked about, opening up our borders. They're a big, big part, part of the picture and they're, they're big solutions to a lot of problems, but they're not panaceas. Um, it's just like Oscar Wilde written, you know? Every time we arrive in Utopia, we, we realize that it's not really Utopia yet and we set sail for an even better country. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not something that will 
solve all problems, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's absolutely not true. But I think it's, it's one of the most exciting new ideas out there right now. And we've just hit nine o'clock. Everybody, thank you so much. And um, Rutger is great. His book is fantastic. If you don't own a copy, buy a copy. I believe you're going to be signing them. I will. And he's like one of Europe's most impressive young intellectuals. <laughs> so don't miss your chance, Melbourne. Um, can you please give him a huge round of applause? Thank you.